The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8734. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, uh, setting a timetable for a stage three consideration of the seatbelts in the School Transport Scotland Bill. I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to meet buttons. Um, I call on uh, Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore the question is that motion 8734 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is Scottish Parliament corporate body questions. I have, just looking here, nine questions. I'll certainly intend to take them all and supplementaries on this very important issue. Question number one, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body, in light of the recent reports on the issue, how it defines sexual harassment. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, sexual harassment is a form of unlawful discrimination under the Equality Act 2010. The law says it's sexual harassment if the behaviour is either meant to or has the effect of violating your dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. The corporate body's dignity at work policy defines harassment as any unwelcome behaviour or conduct which has no legitimate workplace function and which makes you feel offended, humiliated, intimidated, frightened and or uncomfortable at work. Harassment can occur as an isolated incident or as a persistent behaviour and is essentially about what the recipient deems to be offensive, not about what was intended. And, President Officer, I would reiterate what the President Officer said in his letter last week. Parliament has a zero tolerance approach to harassment and sexual misconduct. Gail Ross. I thank David Stewart for that answer. I've spoken to women who have told me that different levels of harassment and inappropriate behaviour um, has made them feel very uncomfortable. But it's not just unlawful, as he said, it is how they feel, and I'm glad that that's been included. Can you also tell me what support is given to these people that come forward with allegations of abuse, harassment or inappropriate behaviour? David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think uh, Gail Ross makes excellent points. Harassment and sexual misconduct uh, is never warranted and those who are harassed are never to blame. And we need, as the First Minister said today, uh, a change in culture. Uh, we have now um, launched our helpline and we want this to be a single source where people can come for advice as to what the procedure uh, might be available to them. We have circulated today posters which are throughout the Parliament, uh, and I'm delighted that uh, this helpline is up and running. If this helpline gets very specialist referrals, which require follow-on for more detailed counselling, our trained HR staff will refer these, uh, these uh, referrals on uh, to more specialist organisations which can provide advice, counselling and assistance. Thank you. Supplementary, Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given that um, sexual harassment and violence against women are both a cause and a consequence of wider women's inequality, would the corporate body agree that we have to tackle the wider issues, including representation? David Stewart. Uh, thank you. I think the member makes uh, an excellent point. I think the key thing here, uh, as the First Minister said earlier, is we have a change in culture. And this is an issue, of course, for the corporate body, but also, I would reiterate, to President Officer, an issue for political parties and society at large. Harassment and sexual misconduct is never warranted in any walk of life, and I'm glad that we can take a leadership position on this with an excellent suite of policies. But I would uh, flag up if any member of staff in the corporate body, any MSP, any MSP staff or intern, feels in any way that there's any form of harassment or sexual misconduct, I would ask them to contact our helpline, which is now up and running at 0800 519 Thank you. Question two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, in light of recent reports regarding sexual harassment, how it intends to influence the gender composition of the corporate body and the Parliamentary Bureau. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding uh, Officer. I think it's probably worth uh, beginning uh, in answer to Kezia Dugdale's question to clarify the way in which the members of the corporate body uh, are appointed. 
Uh, as the members are aware, they are elected by Parliament and uh, were done so in May last year. Uh, and that by convention, the nominations for those uh, positions are made by the political parties uh, in Parliament. Now, the presiding officer and individual corporate body members have raised concerns about this issue previously. Uh, the presiding officer, with the agreement of the corporate body and bureau, sought and secured changes to the Parliament's standing orders earlier this year to require political parties to consult each other and have regard to gender balance when putting forward names for either of these bodies. Now, the member will be well aware that the standing order change has not yet translated into gender balance on either the corporate body or the bureau, and that does remain a matter of regret. And I would just emphasize that we all need to work together on this and that political parties are key to the changes being made given their role in nominating candidates. And that's why the presiding officer is writing today to all party leaders, asking them to sit down with him collectively and look at how we can address this issue quickly and achieve change. Kezia Dunbeal. I thank Andy Whiteman for that answer. And the gender balance of committees, of shadow cabinets, cabinets and backroom teams is equally important. But this is an opportunity to talk about the composition of the Parliament's governing body. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the work of members, not least David Stewart from my own party, for what is an often thankless and time-consuming task. But we've heard from members of the corporate body at various times in this Parliament talk about advancing gender equality and the importance of it. But I hope that those same members understand that for women to have access to power and decision making, it does sometimes require men to give that power away. And it's on that basis that I invite members of the corporate body to resign their roles so that we can achieve gender balance in this place before demanding it from the world beyond it. Andy Whiteman. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues agree with the sentiment behind that uh, question. It's not obviously for the corporate body to have a view on the future of any of its individual members. That's a matter for individual uh, members. But as I indicated earlier, as a body, we stand ready to work with political parties in this place and Parliament as a whole to achieve gender balance uh, in the corporate body. Obviously, we can't speak for committees and the Bureau, which are uh, selected in slightly different uh, grounds. I would just take this opportunity, presiding officer, to um, I acknowledge the fact that I understand that Gordon MacDonald, um, MSP, has resigned from the corporate body earlier today for health reasons. Um, I'm sure all members would join with me in wishing him a very, very speedy uh, recovery. Uh, and I'd just like to put on record on behalf of the corporate body the valuable service that he's, he's given to the body. Uh, Kezia Dugdale says it's a thankless uh, task. It's actually quite enjoyable uh, some of the time. Um, but it does play a very, very important uh, role in setting standards and practices and culture and policies and procedures uh, for, for the Parliament. Supplementary, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Andy Whiteman says it's an enjoyable task. I, I can comment for the, the female members that are here. None of us would know. Um, what is the Scottish Parliament, except uh, Linda Fabiani perhaps, what is the Scottish Parliament corporate body's view on mandating committee conveners to gender balance witness panels? Andy Whiteman. Uh, that would be a matter for the Parliamentary uh, Bureau, for Parliament as a whole. I, I think that's a question of standing orders, perhaps. The corporate body doesn't have a view at this stage on matters um, relating to gender balance of witness panels, etc. Obviously, there are responsibilities for committee members, conveners, uh, clerks, and other people in this place. Uh, but the member raises a very, very important point, and that is that gender balance and gender equality is something we should all be striving to achieve in all walks of life, in every workplace and in every process. And there are very, very good historic reasons why we continue to suffer from patriarchy. Uh, and I would agree that we need to challenge that wherever and whenever it arises in the processes and the procedures of all aspects of public life. Question three, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, in light of recent reports regarding sexual harassment, whether it will initiate an independent review of reporting procedures and parliamentary culture. Jackson Carlow. Can I thank the member for the question? The Parliament commitment to diversity was underlined by the publication of its diversity and inclusion strategy in February of this year. And the diversity and inclusion board will be overseeing the implementation of this strategy. That's why that board has been asked to review the procedures 
for reporting and investigating harassment. The board is co-chaired by two members of the Parliament's leadership group. It is made up of representatives from the Parliament's six equality networks, the Parliament's trade unions, and an external board member, Professor Sir Jeff Palmer, a prominent academic and currently honorary president of the Lothians Regional Equality Council. In addition, we're very pleased to report today that Emma Rich from Engender will be providing advice to the board on this work. We will also be issuing a survey to all those, all those working at Holyrood and in members' local offices to help us understand the issues and the barriers that exist and to build up a picture of the overall culture within the parliament and across the political parties. We will be seeking external expert advice in drawing up this survey, analysing the results and in looking at our next steps. Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon. I thank the member for his reply. Reporting sexual assault or speaking about sexual harassment is never easy. And unlike some inaccurate media reporting, what we are all discussing today is not a sex scandal, but an abuse of power, usually by senior men over women. Our parliament and our own parties have been rocked by serious allegations. None of us as politicians can dare to try and score points. I welcome the steps that are being taken by the Scottish Parliament, an anonymous phone line, a confidential survey, posters and a 24-hour counselling service. All of it is very practical and very welcome. Last Tuesday at Topical Questions, I stood here and said that unless we understand how difficult it is for women, and I include myself, to come forward with complaints, given our fear that we will not be believed or supported, unless we recognise that we are dealing with a cultural problem, then we'll never fully resolve this abuse of power. Last week I said nothing short of an independent review um, would do, and I, and I welcome some of the progress that's been made to come towards that, including news today that the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee will be launching an inquiry into how the Parliament deals with the incidents of sexual harassment and what procedures, rules and support is available. But on its own, that isn't going to be sufficient either. So whilst I appreciate that um, experts, including Emma Rich, who I'm a big fan of, by the way, will, will be taking part, does the corporate body agree that we do need to make it very clear and show that what we are doing is independent, independent from MSPs. Um, you know, the, 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 the committee that I mentioned, again, I admire your work, but again, it's five men and two women. So can we do everything that we can to show that we are taking independent steps to look at every single part of this, the culture, the procedures, the policies, and the support? Jackson Carlo. I understand and sympathize with the sentiments underpinning um, uh, Monica Lennon's supplementary. Uh, the purpose of this survey is, in the first instance, to try and appreciate in some detail the actual scope of the issue and the range of issues that we may, as a parliament, have to face. And obviously, we'll have an opportunity, when we see the analysis of that, uh, to be able to understand what next steps we might take. I think it is important, or useful at least, to say at this stage that um, we are actually working at the moment on the structure of that survey. We want to get it out before the end of the month. Uh, and so members present here today who may be able to or have ideas as to questions that might be included or the way questions might be included within that survey, uh, their thoughts would be very welcomed by the corporate body as we take this work forward. Brief supplementary, Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. Uh, I understand that the Parliament confirmed to the Guardian newspaper this morning that the hotline is not a reporting mechanism for victims of sexual harassment. And given that the leaflet actually says speak up and speak out, I wonder if Jackson Clar uh, could, Carlo could clarify that. And separately, does he understand that with the hotline only operating between nine and five, people will have to use it during the working day and that adds additional complications? Jackson Carlo. Uh, can I thank Kezia Dugdale for that? Can I say that it's important to say that the uh, those people who have concerns can also represent them through the confidential website as well, because we recognise not only that the website is that the hotline is only available during certain hours of the day, but that it might be difficult for people to access a secure area in which to make a confidential phone call. So we have that website link as well, which will then allow a conversation to be facilitated at a time and in a place which is suitable for the individual who might wish to make the call. Question four, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. And quite a lot of what, what I wanted to bring up has probably already been covered, but I am going to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, in light of recent reports regarding sexual harassment, whether it would consider a confidential and independent audit of the experiences of MSPs and staff 
of sexual harassment to inform any decisions on how to protect them in the future. Jackson Carlo. Yeah, I, I suppose, as I said in response to the previous question, we will be issuing an anonymised survey to understand more about the extent of the problem and how we can further promote and underpin a positive working environment for everyone. Therefore, while we have a wide range of employers on the parliamentary campus, including MSPs, political parties, Scottish Government and others, this survey will be sent to everyone who works in and for the Parliament, including those MSPs, MSP staff and parliamentary staff. Gillian Martin. You've mentioned that you are uh, engaged with Emma Rich. Can I ask if there's any other women's groups that you're reaching out to to inform your progress as you take these things forward? Jackson Carlo. Uh, we are still considering uh, the various individuals and bodies who might be able to assist. And if the member has any suggestions as to other bodies that we might engage with in drafting that survey, we'd, the corporate body would be very happy to consider those. Supplementary Gail Ross. I beg your pardon, I thought you were asking a supplementary. Uh, number, question number five, Daniel Johnson, please. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body what changes it plans to make to its procedures and policies regarding the operation of bars and receptions in the Parliament in the light of the role that such context and alcohol had in recent reports regarding sexual harassment. Jackson Carlin. Um, as I have said, our Diversity and Inclusion Board will review our processes and procedures. Our survey is intended to give us a better understanding of all the issues. And if the survey's findings were to suggest to us that further reviews need to take place, we will consider the best way of taking this forward. We only have one bar that is open in the evening, and that serves bistro-style meals, snacks, teas, coffee, and home baking, and additionally serves alcohol between 4 p.m. and 11 p.m. on sitting days. Daniel Johnson, please. Can I thank Jackson Carlaw for that answer? But let me begin by saying there is no excuse or satisfactory justification for the behaviour and incidents of sexual harassment that have come to light in recent weeks, full stop. To tackle it, we must consider the culture of politics in Parliament. I've been struck by the observations of many people from outside this place that it is odd that we have a bar in what is meant to be a place of work. Now, the consumption of alcohol is not an excuse for harassment, but bars and free alcohol at receptions make the drinking culture part of this job. Does the corporate body agree with me that if we are to tackle this culture that has given rise to these incidents, we must question what role alcohol has played and by extension the policies and practices of Parliament with regard to it. Jackson Carlin. I understand the point the member is making and I suppose it may, appoint, uh, it may apply to the broader political world but we don't have the same sitting pattern here as at Westminster where many of these things are reported uh, or as many bars. As I've said we have one evening bar which on sitting days serves alcohol between 4 and 11 p.m. and also serves uh, a variety of other meals and snacks. We also have to remember that events and receptions have a key objective of creating opportunities for public participation and engagement and inform the work of Parliament and its members. As I said a moment ago, obviously the an anonymised survey that we are issuing will allow, if this is an issue of concern, uh, all those who receive it to make representations in, the, in this regard. But certainly my own experience, uh, and I know of many other members, is that the bar that we have uh, is an asset to the Parliament and that the use of it, as far as I have been able to determine, is one which we can, I think, regard as responsible. I have, uh, on this, five members wanting to ask supplementaries. I will... I, I wonder why. I'll, uh, I will take them all, as I said, but please be brief. So I've got Claire Hockey, followed by Ruth McGuire, followed by Monica Lennon, followed by Sandra White, followed by Claudia Beamish. Please be brief. Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The context or settings of sexual harassment, whether at receptions, in bars, or indeed following the consumption of alcohol, are no excuse for such behaviour. And I am deeply concerned that a question such as that asked by Daniel Johnson may give the impression that in some way women should avoid these settings in order to protect themselves. Indeed, in the worst case scenario, this could be viewed in some way as victim blaming. Would the Scottish Parliament corporate body agree with me that it is the perpetrators of sexual harassment who are responsible for their actions and that those women who have been harassed are in no way to blame for what has happened to them. Jackson Carlo. 
Yes, I would agree entirely with that. I think it's absolutely fundamentally important to say that alcohol is not an excuse and should not be used as evidence of a reason why people might excuse behaviour which is totally unacceptable. And I think the member put the point very well. Ruth McGuire. Very briefly, presiding officer, I think Claire covered it pretty well, but I just wonder if they would like to reiterate that alcohol does not cause sexual harassment, but is also often used as a self-justification for perpetrators, and that's what we should be aware of. Jackson Carlo. Again, I agree with the sentiments that the member has expressed. I think it's important to say that we have, in the view of many, uh, a responsible use of alcohol in the Scottish Parliament and that it is not something I think people should be allowed to point to to excuse behaviour which is completely unacceptable and could be taking place anywhere within the Parliament and wherever it takes place is completely unacceptable. Monica Lennon. Thank you. Just to reiterate that it is never the, an excuse or a justification, as I say, alcohol, um, for the behaviour that we're talking about. And um, the vast majority of people drink responsibly. But what we're not hearing enough about today is the behaviour of men, the behaviour of the perpetrators. And I would ask members and the corporate body to reflect on that and take that seriously, because quite frankly, this is a distraction to what we're trying to get to today. Jackson Carlo. I thank Monica Lennon for that. I think it is important to say that even within our events team, the team who are serving uh, alcohol at events, and it's kind of packaged on the basis of 2.5 drinks per person attending an event, not those members who are uh, uh, making use of the bar. The team actually know how many of, know many of the customers and actually do monitor what is being consumed. So it's not that they simply allow alcohol to be consumed uh, without reference to how much is being drunk. But I think it is important to say this question sits in amongst issues which are of more fundamental concern and with which I agree. Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. Um, having served in the Justice Committee, I heard many occasions where offenders would use alcohol as an excuse uh, for abuse. Uh, will the member agree with me that alcohol is never an excuse for abuse? It's the perpetrator, as has been said before, who actually has to look at his responsibilities. Jackson Carlo. Yes, I can unreservedly agree with that. And that is not an unreserved agreement simply in relation to this, this parliament. That is an unreserved agreement without qualification. It is not an acceptable reason for behaviour of that character anywhere, never mind in this parliament. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I think in a sense the point has been made, but I did press my... Sorry, your microphone. There we go. Good help if I use my <laughs> microphone. Sorry. Um, uh, simply to reiterate the points made by other members in relation to this question, that um, alcohol is not an excuse and alcohol is not the issue. Abuse of power is. And I hope that the um, member who's answering the questions on this will agree with me and that that is what we need to go for together, which the general tone of this, um, uh, these um, discussions that we're sharing have, um, have driven us towards. Jason I think it's important to say that the anonymised survey is not an anonymised survey about the consumption of alcohol within the Parliament. If people want to raise that within any response they may, it is precisely about the very issues that uh, Claudia Beamish is raising and it is very important that in the scope of questions that we put we manage to address all of these points and give people every opportunity to express concerns that they may have so that we can then on an informed basis decide what further action needs to be taken and with whom and how. Question six, Claire Baker. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body what action this is taking to address sexual harassment in the Parliament. Liam McArthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As David Stewart said uh, earlier, the uh, Presiding Officers and indeed uh, all of the party leaders have made it emphatically clear that uh, the Parliament takes a zero tolerance approach to sexual harassment. We have a number of policies and processes in place to deal with complaints and the number of reported cases of sexual harassment is low. But I, I think as Jackie Bailey very helpfully reminded us at um, First Minister's questions earlier uh, today, that doesn't necessarily mean it is not taking place. That is why we're taking steps to ensure people who experience harassment feel able to talk about it and are aware of the right route for reporting their concerns. So we have set up our helpline to offer information and guidance on the routes available and to encourage reporting. We're looking at whether any of our procedures need strengthened and we will issue a survey, as Jackson Carlo just said, to all building users. It's important we look at all our policies and procedures, but it's equally important that those who harass others realise they need to change their behaviour. Clear Baker. Uh, thank you. Um, I am concerned that there's not a common grievance procedure and if 
MSPs staff don't have the same equality of treatment within Parliament as Parliament staff. They're not covered by the Dignity at Work policy. And it is confusing and potentially intimidating for a MSP staff member to know how to make a complaint. And I imagine it's difficult for MSPs to have to raise a complaint against a colleague. So I am concerned about how these complaints are dealt with. And if the complaint concerns MSPs and their staff, it will be the parties who deal with these and I'm a bit unclear as to how the Scottish Parliament corporate body um, has a role in this and I'm, I'm also concerned that we don't have the same level of confidence in the political parties about the robust procedures that they might have in place so I'm wondering if the Scottish Parliament corporate body has any role in perhaps coordinating the political parties and the way in which they might deal with these type of complaints. Liam McArthur. I, I, I thank Claire Baker for her supplementary and certainly can understand some of the concerns that arise uh, around perhaps confusion about the different uh, arrangements that are in place in each of the political parties. I think what has been helpful in a sense out of um, uh, the discussion around uh, this issue over recent weeks is the amount of uh, discussion between parties as well as within parties about the procedures that are in, in place. I, I think um, it is probably important uh, uh, or necessary to uh, acknowledge within all this um, the role of MSPs as, as employers and that does present perhaps uh, a, a challenge. I think what the corporate body has sought to do is, is as I say, provide um, that dialogue um, with, between parties as well as within parties and also to provide, um, not least through the, uh, the helpline and, and the publicity uh, that we are putting around uh, the, the, the complex as a whole, a kind of reassurance that there is that, uh, that route for, for guidance uh, and support uh, available to whoever uh, wishes to raise a complaint. Supplementary Donald Cameron. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> in line with the question asked by, by Claire Baker, but given the Parliament is an employer, the Scottish Government is an employer, MSPs are individual employers, and in addition, political parties will have their own policies and codes of conduct. Um, is the corporate body concerned about the need for the consist a consistency of approach in terms of procedures and policies for everyone who works here? And do they have any observations as to how that consistency can be achieved? Liam McArthur. Well, I think that's, I, I mean, I think it's helpful, as I say, that um, there has been this discussion, not just within uh, parties, but between parties. And I would very much hope that there is a, a common learning to, to, to be had. I mean, none of us has, um, to, to, to coin a phrase, a monopoly of wisdom here. I think um, through our own experience, we will know things that have worked well, perhaps things that haven't worked as we uh, intended, and therefore that there are lessons to, to be learnt from that. Uh, I think it's up to political parties to, to, to look at their own procedures and to see where those need to be strengthened. As a corporate body, we can perhaps help facilitate that, but ultimately it's for, it is for political parties. Um, and indeed, I think uh, the, uh, Donald Cameron is absolutely right to, to remind us um, of the range of different employers here, to which I would add uh, media organisations, uh, the, the contractors that, that work here in large numbers uh, as well. And therefore, providing total kind of consistency across the board may be, um, may be difficult, but I would certainly hope that there is a common learning to be had about uh, what works. And, and, and underlying all this, it's about processes, but it's also about conveying the message that I think other colleagues have said. Um, that there is a zero tolerance of this behaviour, not just in this parliament, we should be taking a, a lead in that respect, but across society as a, as a whole. Question seven, Ash Denham. To ask the Scottish parliamentary corporate body whether it will consider producing a code of conduct for MSPs and their staff regarding their behaviour in relation to sexual harassment. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, section seven of the code of conduct for members sets out the rules on general conduct that members uh, must follow. Uh, under the code, members must abide by policies that are adopted by the corporate body, and this includes the dignity at work policy. In practice, that means that members are expected to abide by the spirit of the policy, but the separate codes of conduct for members sets out the procedure to be followed if there's a complaint against a member. The dignity at work policy sets out the definition of harassment, the type of behaviour likely to constitute harassment, and the responsibilities that people have to create a safe working environment where people are treated with respect. And the Parliament's Diversity and Inclusion Board is going to review our procedures for reporting and investigating harassment, and as we've heard, the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee is going to review the Code of Conduct to ensure it remains fit for purpose. Ash Denham. I thank the member for that answer. 
Would the corporate body consider producing a new standalone uh, handbook style publication perhaps on sexual harassment and ideally drawn up with input from organisations that specialise in this area? It might also be helpful if it would include some examples to assist those individuals in recognising inappropriate behaviour. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think that's uh, an excellent idea, uh, and I will contact the uh, clerks involved in the Diversity and Inclusion Board to pass on that piece of advice and ask them to contact the member directly so we can pick up that best practice. Question 8, Sandra White. <clears throat> thank you, President Officer. To ask the corporate body, in light of recent reports regarding harassment, what provisions are in place to protect staff and interns employed by MSPs? David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As I said in response to Ash Denham, the Member's Code of Contact uh, sets out rules on the general conduct that members must follow and the routes to be followed if someone has a complaint, and that would inc include complaints from interns. The Code doesn't cover the conduct of members towards their own staff because this is governed by employment law. The contract of employment for which all staff are employed are under the auspices of the Member's Expenses Scheme, including the Diversity and Inclusion Policy. But it's important to stress that this policy states that members in the role as employers have a zero tolerance approach to any form of discrimination, harassment, bullying or victimisation. The policy directs staff to raise grievances on such ma uh, matters using the established grievance procedure. And although technically complaints will be investigated by the employing member or someone appointed by them, I would strongly point out uh, that in the interest of fairness, the HR advises that members should always appoint someone else to investigate. Harassment of any kind is cited as gross misconduct under the established disciplinary procedure. Sandra White. I, I thank Dave Stewart for his reply, um, basically the response that, and about the code of conduct as well. And uh, just as a wee add-on, I sometimes wonder whether it would be better if MSPs did not employ staff. And it would, but that's a, another story. I may come in with another question on that later. And they would be employed directly by the Parliament, which I would think might protect staff and interns more. Um, but uh, in regard to the action that's been taken in setting up the confidential phone line and dedicated room where staff and interns can go for advice, it is very, very welcome. I do know, however, the posters which I received and everyone received uh, today, which are welcome also, uh, and have been produced, uh, have is headed in very large print sexual abuse. However, harassment, has been said before, can come in many guises and not just sexual, uh, such as bullying and intimidation. Uh, therefore, can the member confirm to me that the measures put in place will cover all forms of harassment? David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. If you forgive me, I won't raise the issue of the direct and whether the corporate body should employ staff or members. That perhaps will be a question for Sandra White at a future meeting. Whether I'm here to deal with it or not is another question. Uh, but I would emphasise to her that harassment is a most general, widespread term. And I would basically flag up that with our zero tolerance position, anyone who feels harassed, bullied or are subject to sexual misconduct should contact uh, the Parliament. Uh, the advice line is one way. There are obviously existing ways through the code. The key point is we have zero tolerance and I would encourage anyone, irrespective of the job they do in the Parliament, to contact the helpline if they feel in any way they're subject to harassment. Thank you. Question nine. Last question. Jackie Bailey, please. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether its new sexual harassment hotline will accept calls from bystanders who witness inappropriate language and behaviour. Liam McArthur. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, unequivocally, yes. Uh, we have set up a dedicated web page, as others have referred to, with details about the helpline. We're also distributing uh, posters and cards around the building. On all of these, we make clear that people should phone the helpline if they have either seen, heard or experienced sexual harassment for information about the appropriate reporting channels. Jackie Bailey. Could I thank Liam McArthur for his positive response because as you'll know it's widely acknowledged that it is difficult for people to report harassment so we need to make sure the phone line is open to as wide a group as possible. It's not altogether clear from the posters that you are encouraging bystanders to report as well so I wonder whether you would reflect on that because there are indeed occasions when MSPs or staff witness inappropriate behaviour or have it reported to us and we need to encourage reporting of that too. Um, could I ask him what will the process be if a third party does contact the helpline, how will their complaint be progressed? Liam McArthur. 
thank you very much. I think Jackie Bailey makes a, a very fair point. This is the first print run of these posters. I think if there are um, if there are suggestions about how we might uh, improve the the, the, the the profile around the uh, the Parliament complex, um, certainly those are ones we would be looking uh, to take on on board. And I think to the point about um, bystanders reporting, I think it's it's, it's very clear that um, the zero tolerance approach will only work if all of us take responsibility, whether we're directly affected um, in the instance uh, or whether we see it happening um, to, uh, to other colleagues, staff uh, or building users. Uh, and I think uh, that is a, a point very well made. In terms of bystanders phoning uh, the, the helpline, in a sense, the advice is then there for how that, that complaint uh, or that concern can be best triaged. I think, as David Stewart mentioned in response to an earlier question, there may often be quite specialist um, support, uh, more specialist response that will, um, will, will need to be provided. And therefore, I think what the, the, the helpline will do is provide a kind of portal um, for then onward dissemination of that, that complaint in an appropriate fashion. Um, and that will obviously depend on whether it's a, a bystander or somebody who has been directly, directly affected. Thank you. And that concludes questions to the Parliament's corporate body. And I'll pause for a few seconds to allow the front benches to change. Move on to the next item of business.